Hello, everyone. Now, I know that it's hard to keep up on top of what's going on in the Holy Land, but if you want to know more about what's happening here in Israel, I'm Aaron Porras, and this is the Weekly Review. A bitter ending to the latest major terror attack. 19-year-old Israeli student Yehuda Gueta succumbing to his critical injuries Wednesday night following a drive-by shooting attack at the Tepoach Junction in the West Bank. In the funeral taking place Thursday morning in Kiryat Moshe, Friends from the yeshiva describing Gueta as a quiet and gentle person who liked to tell jokes. But Gueta was survived by his parents and six siblings, one of the three Israelis injured in the attack, all 19-year-old students at a nearby religious seminary. Benaya Peretz being the second victim who remains in serious condition at the hospital, while Amichai Chala released home with relatively light injuries. And as for the terrorists involved, just hours after Gueta's passing, the Shin Beit Security Service announcing an end to the, to the days-long manhunt. The prime suspect, a 44-year-old West Bank Palestinian businessman, being discovered hiding in the town of Silwad with light injuries to the legs sustained during the attack when IDF soldiers fired back at him. Further confirmed now as a lone gunman, the suspect's family members and alleged affiliates have all been released from interrogation. Now, the meetings have ended, President Rivlin confirming his choice Wednesday evening, and the second candidate to try and form a coalition will be opposition leader and chair of the Yeshatid party, Yair Lapid. על בסיס ההמלצות שקיבלתי מסיעות הכנסת ומתוקף סמכותי על פי סעיף 9 של חוק יסוד הממשלה, שוחחתי זה עתה עם חבר הכנסת יאיר לפיד והודעתי לו כי אני מעניק לו את המנדט להרכבת הממשלה. Rivlin then asking the citizens of Israel not to lose faith in the political system just yet adding that it's clear Lapid could technically form a government. Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu losing his chance at a government Tuesday, President Rivlin then getting new recommendations from the 120 current Knesset members, and Yair Lapid, as many expected, got the vote. In fact, Lapid receiving 56 recommendations, including from right-wing Gideon Sar's New Hope Party, and five of six votes from the predominantly Arab joint list. The Islamist Ram Party, on the other hand, choosing not to recommend anyone, but promising to cooperate positively with whomever Rivlin chooses, while Naftali Bennett receiving seven votes from his own Yamina party, and the 52-strong right-wing bloc under Netanyahu calling for the mandate to return to the Knesset. In any case, with Lapid now holding the reins, both he and Bennett reportedly working towards a unity government, with a probable rotating premiership, where Naftali Bennett would serve first. The two party leaders saying that they're confident they could sign a deal in as soon as a week. Moving on, airstrikes reported in Syria for the second day in a row. Syrian news agencies again alleging Israel is responsible. Explosions seen late Wednesday night near the South Syrian Kunetra province, according to the Sana Syrian State News Agency. And though no casualties have been reported from last night, these strikes coming just a day after one civilian was killed and six others injured in airstrikes to the north in Latakia. Both Sana and the UK-based Syrian Observatory for Human Rights blaming Israel for both attacks, saying the latest strikes were led by a helicopter just north of Israel's border. The apparent target, the Syrian army's 90th Brigade and pro-regime military positions near the Israeli Golan Heights. Israel viewing any Iranian or pro-Iranian military entrenchment near the border as unacceptable. And in kind, the IDF launching hundreds of strikes against Iran-affiliated targets in Syria over the last few years. Additionally, this also following a supposedly misfiring Syrian missile strike in late April, the projectile reaching deep into Israeli territory around the Dimona nuclear reactor and setting off air raid sirens nearby. A national day of mourning sweeping across the country today following what many say is the worst peacetime tragedy in Israel's history. 45 people killed, including children and teens, and dozens more injured in a disastrous stampede over the weekend at Mount Meron, and the incident coming at the close of what was supposed to be a celebration. Well over 100,000 Orthodox Jewish worshippers from all over the world taking advantage of Israel's coronavirus turnaround and celebrating the holiday of Lag Ba'omer at Mount Meron, Israel's north. Mount Meron being the grave site of 2nd century Jewish sage Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai. But the festival, including singing, dancing, and lighting large bonfires, ended in tragedy.
In early hours Friday morning, thousands of worshipers crowding a narrow passage at the holy site, resulting in an apparent stampede. Um, we were standing and, and waiting for our friends. Uh, we were going to go inside for the dancing and stuff. And uh, all of a sudden we saw paramedics from MADA and whatever running by uh, like mid CPR on, a, on kids. Uh, and then one after the other started coming out, ambulances. Uh, and then we understood like something's going on here. And uh, we just went to the side as the ambulances were driving in and out. And uh, we waited until we were able to slowly get out. I was there already when it happened to the side and it started from some of the soldiers who were running and then it was a kind of Andalusia, the soldiers, the soldiers, the balagan. And it was like a half hour, like a fire of the soldiers, 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 a fire of the soldiers. Yes, I was there and in the end of the day there was a fire of 6,000 or 7,000 people. It was almost there to go. ואנשים נפלו על הרצפה, כמו... נפלו מאוד על הרצפה. We received information about a lot of injuries. We went to the ground zero. The injuries, injuries start to came, and we start the, the first aid. Uh, unfortunately, at the end, uh, we have uh, 44 uh, deaths, and uh, above uh, 100 uh, injuries in... Uh, דיפרנט סיביריטי. כתוצאה מזה אני רואה מלא אנשים צרחות, צרחות אימים ממש גדולות והמשטרה ראתה את הצרחות אבל היא לא הבינה כנראה עד כמה מה הולך שם חשבו אולי התעלפות או משהו אבל ככל הנראה מהחסימה של המשטרה אלפי אנשים ירדו, זה, זה ירידה של 360 מעלות כלומר לא עומדים ישר, עומדים ממש ממש באלכסון אז כשאלפים נוהרים כלפי מטה קצת לצאת מההדלקה, רקדו שם חצי שעה, רצו לצאת, אז uh, בעצם נוצר מצב של מאות אנשים נפלו אחד על השני, והמראות שראיתי אחר כך עזרתי גם לפנות את, ה... את הנפטרים, המראות היו קשים מאוד. אני הייתי נמחצתי גם עם מתחת לכל האנשים, הראש שלי והחזה היה בחוץ, אז הצלחתי לנשום, אבל uh, עכשיו אני אמור להישאר למעקב, לראות שעדיין הכל בסדר. היה נס שלא, שלא קרה לי שום דבר. זה לא... זה נס שאף אחד לא, לא נפל לי על הראש. זוועה. אי אפשר לתאר את זה ואי אפשר להסביר את זה. זה לא יוצא לך מהראש. In the end, the tragedy actually killing 45 and injuring over some 150. And among those killed, now all identified, at least 10 are children under age 18, including two sets of brothers. And at least nine are foreign nationals. six holding U.S. citizenship, one being from Argentina, and two being Canadian. Israeli officials, meanwhile, declaring Sunday as an official national day of mourning. Flags on state buildings hung at half-mast, public ceremonies and massive funeral services are being held, and leaders in Israel, as well as from around the world, are sending their condolences. This day is a very תפילותינו ומחשבותינו נתונות אל הפצועים ואל משפחות ההרוגים והנעדרים באסון הנורא שאירע אמש בהר מירון. זוהי השעה לחבק את המשפחות, לתת יד לכל המחפשים אחר יקיריהם, לאמץ את הפצועים אל ליבנו ולבכות יחד, לבכות יחד. אסון הר מירון הוא מן האסונות הכבדים ביותר שפקדו את מדינת ישראל. אנחנו דואבים על הנספים, ליבנו עם המשפחות וגם עם הפצועים שאנחנו מייחלים להחלמתם המלאה. היו פה מראות קורעי לב, אנשים שנמחצו אל המוות, כולל ילדים. אנחנו נערוך בדיקה יסודית, רצינית ומעמיקה כדי להבטיח שאסון כזה לא יישנה. ואני מבקש ביום ראשון להכריז על יום אבל לאומי, בואו נתייחד כולנו. עם היגון של המשפחות ובתפילה לשלומם של הפצועים. Now, as for around the world, those sending messages of solidarity and best wishes to Israel, including leaders from all over Europe, Canada, the United States, and many in the Arab world, like in Jordan, Bahrain, and the UAE. Queen Elizabeth of England sending a letter to Israeli President Rivlin, U.S. President Biden calling Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau issuing a statement of condolences and offering assistance. 
and the Pope asking for prayer from the international community as well. Con tristeza esprimo la mia vicinanza alla popolazione di Israele per l'incidente avvenuto venerdì scorso sul Monte Meron che ha provocato la morte di 45 persone e numerose ferite. Assicuro il mio ricordo nella preghiera per le vittime di questa tragedia e per i loro familiari. Even Palestinian Authority President Mahmoud Abbas sending a letter to President Rivlin expressing his sorrow for the disaster that caused dozens of deaths and that he is praying for the victims as well as for the recovery of the wounded. Now Sunday's Palestinian terror attacks coming as Israelis are still mourning the 45 victims killed over Lagba Omer holiday weekend at Mount Meron. A national day of mourning coming to a close Sunday night called for by Israeli leaders out of respect for the 45 victims killed in a crowd crush incident on Friday in the early morning hours. And while most of the over 150 wounded in the Mount Meron disaster have been discharged, several are still hospitalized with more severe conditions. Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu among their many visitors. <laughs> טיפול הנפלא שהם מקבלים על ידי הצוות הרפואי, כפי שהתרשמתי גם מפעולת החילוץ שללא ספק הציל החיים, כולל של חלק מהאנשים שנמצאים כאן. אנחנו מתפללים לשלומם. אחד ההורים אמר לי את המשפט שמסכם את הכל. הוא אמר, פה מגלים שעם ישראל יש לו לב אחד. וליבנו עם הפצועים וכולנו מייחלים להם וגם מתפללים להחלמתם המלאה. As for those who perished, all 45 have now been identified, and the list, including many parents, 10 foreign nationals, and at least 10 children under 18, some as young as nine and some sets of brothers, leaving waves of heartbreak worldwide. It's a, probably one of the biggest tragedies that has happened in the last many, many years. It's, it's shook up everybody, and I think it's making the people feel that we're not looking at which group you're from or who you are, everybody's heart is going out today to those people that were lost, and it's an unfortunate situation. And in other news, a fifth round of negotiations between Lebanon and Israel concerning disputes about the maritime border concluding yesterday with no definitive outcome. According to official Lebanese news, the round of negotiations lasted for five hours under the mediation of the United Nations and the United States. All talks, however, are kept in complete secrecy from the media other than the pictures you are seeing now released by official government channels. Lebanon's president emphasized that Lebanon's desire for negotiation underlines the importance of correcting the maritime borders in accordance with international laws and regulations. Lebanon is in desperate need of the gas-rich maritime border as the country is currently struggling through its worst economic crisis in decades. As Israel slowly becomes accustomed to its new normal, in India, scenes are quite different. The country is in a dire state as its health authorities battle the most difficult wave yet of the COVID-19 pandemic. Israel began sending emergency medical aid, including badly needed oxygen equipment, to India on Tuesday to help fight the surge. The ministry said a series of flights throughout the week would carry and deliver that much needed equipment. During the first days of the pandemic in Israel early last year, India has sent us much needed medical equipment, including gloves, masks, and materials for medicines. This is now a small token of friendship and reciprocity from Israel to India. Well, today we are witnessing uh, the first uh, medical assistance that Israel sends to uh, India. You are witnessing now uh, yet another milestone of uh, the bond, the unbreakable bond between Israel and India. Israel is standing now by India and sending uh, medical equipment, oxygen generators and oxygen respirators. Moving on now to something moving. Israel's first ever transgender premier soccer referee, 
taking to the field for the first time since coming out publicly as a woman earlier last week. In a league first for Israel, 26-year-old soccer referee Sapir Berman taking to the pitch Monday evening for the latest match between Israeli teams Hapoel Haifa and Beitar Jerusalem. But why is this a historic first for Israel? Well, because this is Berman's first time presiding over a match as a woman, making her the country's first ever trans soccer referee. Having served as a ref in the Premier League for years already, Sapir came out publicly as a trans woman in late April, explaining that she'd been struggling with her gender identity for years. And this was her first day on the job in her new shoes, or cleats. I always saw myself as a child. It was a very young age. In the beginning, I didn't know how to give it a name. I didn't know how to call it. But I always had a side of the man. I was a kind of man. And I lived in it. אם זה באיגוד השופטים, ואם זה בלימודים, ואם זה עם בנות. אבל כשהייתי לבד, אני הייתי אישה. וחילקתי את העולמות האלה, כי הבנתי שהחברה לא תקבל אותי. While it's true that Sapir's transition may not be accepted by all, though, most reactions have been positive. Berman seen chatting and laughing casually with players before the kickoff. ישנם גם שחקנים שפונים אליי בלשון נקבה כבר, שהם ממש מרגישים ש... הם רוצים לקחת איפשהו מקום בתהליך הזה, ואפילו פונים אליי שאין צורך לפנות אליי, ופונים אליי בלשון אישה. אז תודה לכם. And that's not just the other staff, the league, administrators, and athletes. Off the field too, fans are expressing their full acceptance of Sapir's new identity, if not outright full support. And by the way, Haifa beat Jerusalem on Monday night's match 3 to 1. Moving along now. You know those lamps in cartoons that have genies inside? Well, you're not getting three wishes, but a Temple-era bronze oil lamp was discovered during excavations in the city of David's Pilgrimage Road in Jerusalem. Israel Antiquities Authority archaeologists say that the rare bronze oil lamp, shaped like a distorted face, was intentionally deposited in order to bring good luck to the building's residents, and it dates all the way back to the Roman period. This lamp is an extremely unique find, and it's the first of its kind in Israel. For now, the lucky lamp is currently in the hands of the Israel Antiquities Authority for further research. Now, meantime, and in light of both the coronavirus and the tragedy on Mount Merom, Israeli police are putting restrictions on Christian worship in Jerusalem as well, ahead of the annual Holy Fire Festival. Police on Saturday taking extra precautions near the Church of the Holy Sepulchre in Jerusalem. This ahead of the arrival of thousands of Christian pilgrims for the annual Holy Fire ceremony. But as the ceremony is set to begin just the day after a deadly stampede in Mount Meron, police got to work setting up barricades to handle the holiday crowds, especially as the Holy Fire ceremony was canceled last year due to the pandemic and has in previous years attracted crowds of at least 10,000 worshippers. Main purpose is to keep the security of all the prayers, especially in this day. A hundred of officers of cops from the border officers and traffic officers on the field. And as I mentioned, our purpose is to keep the safety and allow freedom the uh, Christians uh, that we expect uh, to uh, get uh, the, uh, this holy church, uh, the speculative church here in this special day. In light of recent clashes in Jerusalem between police and Palestinian protesters, however, putting up barricades and checkpoints to limit unvaccinated visitors in and of itself posed challenges. Police reportedly getting rough with small pockets of visitors over a handful of various issues. Though that said, many photos from the ceremony also show police mixing appropriately into the crowds to do their work. A police statement explaining that securing an event like this is a complex and challenging task, adding that police and border police officers are determined and motivated to carry out their mission while showing sensitivity to the needs of the many visitors and believers who frequent the area. 
Make art, not war. One ex-Israeli soldier has taken that sentiment to the next level with a new artistic medium, certainly not for the faint-hearted. Watch this. My name is David Reutemann. I'm using sniper rifle to create my art. Make art, not war. Former Israeli army sniper David Reutemann has turned his hand to action painting, but with live fire ranges as studios and guns instead of brushes to blast colors into abstract patterns. After 20 years in the service, in the active uh, unit, everybody needs therapy. So to be honest, this is my... Uh, Healing by art, when I'm shooting, not on the people, not in the war, not during the military service. I'm doing this for my, let's say, fun, for my way to say something to the world. It's make me feel peacefully. Using a pistol in Israel and the cannon of a World War II era tank in his native Ukraine, Reutemann shoots into bags of paint suspended between the muzzles and wood board canvases. Amidst the resulting splashes and holes, he intersperses letters in Hebrew, English, and Russian, seemingly at random, an invitation to the viewer to form words. So this art is uh, made by Jewish letters, Hebrew letters, uh, words of peace in Hebrew, Russian, and English. And covers symbolize my feelings about the peace agreement between Jewish state and our Arab neighbors and also symbolized my feelings about the normalization agreement between Israel and Emirates. 20 of the unusual works have sold at between $5,000 and $10,000 a piece, he said. For Reutemann, this juxtaposition is what makes his artwork unique. <laughs> And that's it for ILTV's Weekly Review. I'm Aaron Porras. See you next week.